because some things don't change, even though the terms do. And as I read this, it really, really struck me that some of us are not holding the line, so to speak, as believers. We're not holding ourselves accountable to the tenets of the faith. Hello, everyone. I'm your host, Ebby, and this is Jambalaya Podcast. I invite you to come stir the pot with me as we get into a wide range of topics. Yes, indeed. Where you at? Hello, everyone. This is Jambalaya Podcast, Episode 3. And the title of our podcast today is going to be, How Do We Know We're Not Brainwashed? Are we under a type of communist thought reform? And if so, how does this technique relate to us today? One of my favorite movies that kind of touches on this subject is called The Manchurian Candidate. It was written in 1962 by John Frankenheimer. And maybe to get a better perspective, we should listen to the clip together. Now, Raymond, now the big one. Why? Why is all of this being done? What have they built you to do? I don't know. I don't think anybody really knows except Eretzovo in Moscow and my American operator here. Or whatever it is, it's supposed to happen soon. Right at the convention. Maybe. I don't know. They can make me do anything, Ben. We'll see, kid. We'll see what they can do and we'll see what we can do. So the Red Queen is our baby. Take a look at this, kid. Fifty-two of them. Take a good look at them, Raymond. Look at them and while you're looking, listen. This is me, Marco, talking. Fifty-two red queens of me are telling you, you know what we're telling you? It's over. The links, the beautifully conditioned links are smashed. They're smashed as of now because we say so. Because we say they ought to be smashed. We're busting up the joint. We're tearing out all the wires. We're busting it up so good. All the queen's horses and all the queen's men will never put old Raymond back together again. You don't work anymore. That's an order. Anybody invites you to a game of solitaire... You tell him, sorry, Buster, the ball game is over. Now, what we get from that clip is a gentleman who definitely has been, for lack of a better term, he's been uh, brainwashed. And the reason why I wanted to bring this up and use the movie as an example is because many points in our history have had people to disregard the idea of brainwashing. I even did a quick Google search as I was taking down my podcast notes. And one of the things it said was that brainwashing wasn't real. It was something that was kind of brought up in uh, movies and then it became a trope. And then it was maybe a word thrown around uh, via conspiracy theorists and whatnot. But I do want to share an article and It's very interesting what this article bears out. It says that during the Korean War, Americans heard disturbing reports of U.S. prisoners of war being brainwashed by their North Korean and Chinese communist captors. Lurid journalistic accounts described insidious Oriental and Pavlovian methods capable of nothing less than the annihilation of the self. Brainwashing, according to one author, could transmogrify, there's a word for you, a man into a living puppet, a human robot. A Columbia University psychiatrist characterized brainwashing as the, quote, rape of the mind, unquote. Psychic homicide and menticide were also terms used. Like John C. Marx later revealed, the Central Intelligence Agency, yes, that is the CIA, 
had been at work since the earliest days of the Cold War on psychic warfare methods of its own. Under the MK Ultra program, scientists throughout the 1950s and into the following decade used psychedelic drugs, sensory deprivation, hypnosis, and practices such as psychic driving on human subjects. The film Manchurian Candidate tells the story of a returning Korean War hero by the name of Raymond Shaw, played by Lawrence Harvey, who, along with other members of his platoon, was brainwashed while held captive by North Korea. And unbeknownst to everyone except his communist masters, Shaw had been programmed, or for lack of a better term, rebuilt. And this is using the movie's parlance. His former commanding officer, Bennett Marco, played by Sinatra, detects and overcomes his own mind scrubbing. And then Marco goes on to disrupt a conspiracy that includes Shaw's harridan of a mother, played by Angela Lansbury, married to a buffoonish McCarthy-like right-wing senator. She is, in fact, a secret communist agent working as her son's operator. But she uses the Queen of Diamonds, the playing card. And this is Raymond, her, her son's trigger. And at various points in the film, Lansbury is urging him to pass the time by playing a little solitaire. And every time he sees this card shown to him, there's an immediate reaction. If you ever get a chance, go and watch this movie. It's free. And this particular clip, whenever he says, what is my duty? Or what is it that I'm supposed to be doing? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He never says that. Why does he never ask that? Because when the card is shown, he ceases to be himself. He becomes another person altogether. They have tapped somewhere deep into the mind. And he immediately becomes a robotic figure. He simply answers, yes, sir. No, sir. And then right after he receives his orders through his handler, someone ends up dead at his hands. Even when he kills them, there's one part in the movie where he cries because he's actually killing his, his wife, who he just married. He kills her. And there's this absent, faraway look in his eyes, but tears are streaming down his face. And this is truly the, the behavior of a fractured mind. All right, so to continue. In the aftermath of the Korean conflict, the armed forces developed techniques to help American personnel resist communist interrogation and indoctrination, most notably survival, evasion, resistance, escape, S-E-R-E, -E, SEER, training. Ironically, SEER would later serve as the foundation of the coercive management methods used on Guantanamo Bay detainees. Now, I'm going to kind of break down some of what SEER is. And for all purposes of this podcast, I want you to listen to specific words, but I want you to also maybe remove some. What I mean by that is this, this article on what SEER is or what it does uses terms like America and things related to combat because it is primarily training for military. But I want you to think of it in terms of the American people and people in general, but very specifically followers of Christ. And I want you to think about how these words apply or don't to our situation today and in the future, because some things don't change, even though the terms do. And as I read this, it really, really struck me that some of us are not holding the line, so to speak. As believers, we're not holding ourselves accountable to the tenets of the faith. I don't say the tenets of Christianity because that can have so many different meanings to so many people with 40,000 different denominations of Christianity. Whose Christianity would I be speaking to? So I am very, very firm in the tenets of the Bible, biblical truth, because biblical truth is not limited to a religion, denomination, etc. So I'm going to read some of these seer tactics. There's five of them, and specifically they deal with survival, evasion, resistance, escape. So let's listen. Isolation survival. 
So isolation is not just being, quote unquote, alone. It's being away from the familiar and comforting. Isolation survival has long been part of SEER in the resistance portion of training, but has more recently been recognized as worthy of broader attention. The psychological impact of suddenly finding yourself alone, lost, or outside your comfort zone can be debilitating, seriously depressing, and even fatal via panic. Isolation survival also focuses upon the broader view of captivity to include kidnapping and non-combatant captivity. Isolation survival training has more focus on psychological preparedness and less upon skills. Here are the five, here are five of the things that they list. Number one, understanding and avoiding panic. Does anyone see how that's relative to today? Okay. Number two, the importance of keeping your wits about you. Number three, focus, observe, plan, and envision. Four, stress, fight or flight, coping response, the quote unquote stress cycle and things to help you stay calm. And five, the psychology of captivity. Now, I don't know about you. I could probably do five shows on just those five alone. But for time, we'll continue. Evasion, resistance, and escape. Some elements of hostile survival preparedness and teaching are classified. This is especially true for resistance training, where one hopes to prepare those who might be captured for hardship, stress, abuse, torture, interrogation, indoctrination, and exploitation. It'd be funny if it weren't sad. I actually almost caught myself giggling at this, and not because it's funny, but the irony of it all. The foundation for capture preparedness lies in knowing one's duty and rights if taken prisoner. For American soldiers, this begins with the code of the United States Fighting Force. Now, there are about six things they have listed, but there are five in particular that caught my attention. Um, And out of that five, I'm going to actually only focus on four because of what I just read initially. The first one is, I will never surrender of my own free will if in command. I will never surrender the members of my command while they still have the means to resist. Hmm. The next one, if I'm captured, I will continue to resist by all means available. I will make every effort to escape and to aid others to escape. I will accept neither parole nor quote unquote special favors from the enemy. I know we must all be thinking of some very relative things when I say special favors. The next one says, if I become a prisoner of war, I will keep faith with my fellow prisoners. I will give no information nor take part in any action which might be harmful to my comrades. If I'm senior, I will take command. And the last one, I will never forget that I'm an American fighting for freedom, responsible for my actions dedicated to the principles which made my country free, and I will trust in my God and in the United States of America. Now, I would like to argue that I don't think as believers our loyalty should first and foremost be in any political party or even in our own country. Because as we've all seen in the past couple of years, our country has become less our country. And everyone will have different meanings Um, and understandings as to what that change is. For me personally, it's kind of captured in what I just read. I will never surrender the members of my command. When I think about my command, I think about those in my care or those that are important to me, that I'm concerned for their well-being. Why would I, in the interest of preserving my own life, cast them to the side and not care about their safety? Why would I, for the promise of trinkets and whatever else may come my way, based on what I may need or want at that time, in any way deny protecting those that I not too long ago said I cherished and cared for? Why would I, if captured, why would I not resist? Why would I not make every effort to escape? I mean, the natural, the most natural thing to man is to survive, but not to survive at the point of throwing other people to the wind. And this is what we're seeing now. 
Um, another one is I will keep faith with my fellow prisoners. If other people are suffering just like you, why would you cause them to suffer more? Because one thing I can tell you from reading history is that anybody who ever sold their friends up the river, so to speak, it wasn't too long before they end up drowning in it themselves. I want to maybe end on this note. So training on how to survive and resist an enemy in the event of capture is generally based on past experiences of captives and prisoners of war. Thus, it is important to know two things, who one's captors are, who they're likely to be, and number two, what to expect from them. I would argue that we are dealing with a Manchurian candidate. Um, we are being controlled and it's done very subtly. And a lot of us don't know that we're brainwashed. And the unfortunate thing about that is if you've ever spoken to someone who has Pavlov's dog syndrome. You really can't get through to them because the brainwashing is so entrenched. They're not themselves, just like our character in Manchurian Candidate. They hear a certain word. There's a certain conditioning that has happened. Classical conditioning is what the term is in psychiatry. Certain terms and phrases and behaviors are repeated over and over again. And after a while, people find themselves believing themselves to be free, but they are conditioned to the point of not even knowing what freedom really looks like anymore. They're not even able to do a comparative study of what they once thought, believed, and did and how they lived compared to what they've now um, acclimated to. And those of us that have trying to speak to them is, it just appears to be futile. So I would encourage all of us who are not brainwashed, and that's kind of laughable because remember, if you're brainwashed, you don't really know that you are. I think talking and having open conversations and not trying to shut down disagreement is a good way to stay from being brainwashed because you're always open to hearing arguments from every side, even if you yourself stand firm on a particular belief, which I do. And that is that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and my faith and all my hope is in him. It's not in any politics or politician. It's not in any promises that anybody in leadership can give me, even if they're in the church. And it's definitely not from the culture or the community that, uh, for the most part, has bought into a lot of the brainwashing techniques. It is only from the scriptures and from the Holy Spirit and from my family that also stands firm on the word who holds me accountable. I want to encourage everyone to maybe look into what scripture says, not just about Jesus, but in relation to the world around us and how we're to live in it. So. Until then, please have a wonderful evening, and I enjoyed this time with you. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. Make sure to join me for the next episode as we continue to ask, how does the body of Messiah navigate in the world? To catch all the latest from me, you can follow me on Instagram at jambalaya underscore podcast. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.